This is the 13th video in a series on abstract algebra. And today we're gonna to talk about something which is called external and internal direct products of groups. Starting with so-called external direct products. Let's look at the definition. So given groups G1 star one, G2 star two, where that's the set together with the operation, their external direct product is the set G1 cross G2. So that's the Cartesian product. So those are all ordered pairs A, B, where A goes from G1 and B is from G2. And then furthermore, we define the operation component wise. So I'll call the total operation star, although we'll generally just put these things together like we have been in previous videos, like make it look like multiplication. So anyway, A comma B star C comma D will be A star one C comma B star two D, where this is happening within G1, so we need the operation of G1, whereas this is happening within G2, so we need the operation in G2. And now here's a quick exercise, which I won't do here, but maybe you could add this to the list of warmups, which is at the end of the video. And that is to check that this makes G1 cross G2 into a group, and we can extend it to the direct product of N groups. So that would be the external direct product of G1, G2 up to GN. And furthermore, we could have an infinite direct product as well. So we've got G1 cross G2 cross G3, and it never ends. Okay, so maybe some of you have noticed that we've used simple versions of these groups already, like Z2 cross Z2 or Z2 cross Z3, but this is really just doing it in general. All right, so I'd like to look at some examples before we start proving more general results. Our first example will be Z3 cross U5 cross D4. So these groups are all totally different, which I think makes the example interesting. So that means the first entry comes from Z3, which is our additive group of integers modulo three. Our second entry comes from U5. Let's recall that's the multiplicative group of numbers modulo five. There's some rule about which ones we keep. I'll let you look that up if you need to. And then D4 is the symmetries of the square. Okay, so let's get to it. So if we were to combine these using our operation for their external direct product, we would have in the first entry two plus two because the operation for this first group is addition. And then in the second entry, we would have three times four because in the second group, our operation is multiplication. And then in the third entry, we would have, well, technically it's composition because dihedral groups are all functions acting on certain n-gons. So we would have the combination of SR with SR squared. And now let's see how this will simplify. So two plus two is obviously four, but inside of Z3, that is one. Three times four is 12, but inside of U5, that is two. And then this is maybe a little bit trickier. Let's do the calculation off to the side so that we can make it look a little bit cleaner when we write it down. So this is gonna simplify or maybe reassociate, I should say, to S, R, S, R squared, but then we can flip the R with the S, giving us S squared, R cubed, R squared, using the commutation rule. But then S squared is the identity because it's a reflection, and then R cubed and R squared makes R to the fifth, but since we're in D4, that will just be simply R. Okay, so that would be the combination of those two elements from the external direct product. And then you could, for instance, have infinitely many copies of Z2 as well, and see what you get when you add maybe the alternating sequence 101010 with the alternating sequence 010101. So every entry that here that has a one, there's a zero over here, and then vice versa. So I think this pretty clearly adds to the sequence just of all ones. Okay, so now let's start proving more general results. So our first result will be on the order of an element from an external direct product. 
In particular, let's suppose that A is an element of group G1, B is an element of group G2. The order of A is M, whereas the order of B is N. Then it turns out the order of A, B inside of G1 cross G2 is simply the LCM of M and N. So that's the least common multiple. Okay, so now let's get into the proof and we'll start by introducing a little bit of notation. So let's set K equal to the order of A, B, and then we'll set L equal to the LCM of M with N. Okay, and now we're ready to get going. So since L is equal to the LCM of M and N, we know that L is equal to M times S and L is equal to N times T for some S and T, which are natural numbers. So recall that being the LCM means that you are a common multiple, and this is like essentially showing that there are common multiples or using the fact that it is a common multiple. Okay, nice. And now let's raise a comma b to the l power, but that notice that's a to the l and b to the l. But then using exponent rules as well as these equations right here, that's a to the m to the s, and then b to the n to the s. Okay, but then m, if you recall, is the order of a and n is the order of b. So that means that these things in the parentheses are simply the identities in the corresponding group. That should have been a t. Okay, so that means what we really have here is e1 to the s and then e2 to the t, where e1 is the identity in g1 and e2 is the identity in g2, but if you combine the identity with itself, you clearly get just the identity. So that means we've got e1 comma e2, but that's the identity in the direct product. Okay, so notice that we've raised a comma b to the l power and we got to the identity, but by a previous result, that tells us that the order of a comma b must divide l. But by our notation up here, that means that k must divide l. So we've determined that k divides l, and now we'd like to show that l divides k, which is the classic way of showing that natural numbers are the same using divisibility. Okay, so now we're going to start with E1, E2, and notice that's the same thing as A, B to the K, because K is the order of A, B, but then that's equal to A to the K, B to the K. But then let's look at the left part of this and the right part of this, and recall that ordered pairs are equal if and only if both of the entries are equal. So this tells us that A to the K is equal to E1, and um, b to the k is equal to e2. But now we'll apply that same result again. But then this tells us by that previous result again that the order of a must divide k, so we have m divides k, and the order of b must divide k, so n divides k. But that means that k is a common multiple of m and n. But by the least part of the least common multiple property, that means the least common multiple also divides k. So let's see, we've got k divides l and l divides k, but putting those two things together, we see that k is equal to l. But what does that mean? That means the order of a, b is equal to the LCM of m and n, which is exactly where we wanted to end. All right, let's see some examples of this proposition in work. So there's a really quick corollary to this proposition that says that the order of the element g1, g2 up to gn in this type of direct product is simply the LCM of all of the orders. You can easily prove that with induction. Maybe that's a good exercise if you don't see immediately how that would go. So again, you would do it by induction, keeping in mind that you can maybe partition one thing off at a time. Okay, so now let's look at a couple of examples. So let's find the order of 9 comma 12 inside of Z12 cross Z20. So we're gonna need to check a couple of things here. So we'll first need to check the order of 9 in Z12, and then we'll also need to check the order of 12 inside of Z20, and only after finding those two things can we apply this result. 
Okay, well, I believe we had a previous result in an earlier video that allowed us to calculate these orders fairly easily, and it goes something like this. The order of nine is equal to 12 divided by the GCD of nine with 12. Okay, well, that's pretty easy to calculate. That's gonna be 12 over three, which is four. So that's the order of nine. Now, of course, nine and 12 aren't very big, so you could just add nine to itself until you got around to zero. That's the additive identity here. But, you know, I think this is easier and nice to remember. Now let's calculate the order of 12 inside of Z20. So that's gonna be 20 divided by the GCD of 12 with 20. So that's gonna be 20 divided by four, which is five. So the order of nine is four, the order of 12 is five. So putting these two facts together, we can easily calculate the order of nine comma 12. And so that'll be the LCM of four with five, but those are relatively prime, meaning that, that their LCM is simply their product, so we get 20. Okay, so now let's look at this other example. We've got the product of a two cycle and a three cycle within S5. And then we have this number two, which is inside of U9. So let's notice that the order of this permutation, one, two, three, four, five, is equal to, well, it's in fact the LCM of two and three, which is six. And that's by a result that we had for calculating orders within SN. So recall, you take a permutation and then you write it as a product of disjoint cycles, and then the order is the LCM of the length of all of those cycles. That's what we have right here. And then for the order of two in U9, we actually have to do some work. And what I'll do is I'll calculate the cyclic subgroup generated by two, and then use the fact that the cyclic subgroup generated by two is, has the same order as the order of two. Okay, so we've got two to the zero in there, two to the one, two to the two, which is four, two to the three, which is eight, and then next, two to the four is 16, but inside of U9, 16 is the same thing as seven. Two to the five, well, that'll be two to the four times two, so that's gonna be 17 times two, which is 14, but that is in fact five inside of U9. And then the next one would be two times five, which is 10, but that's one inside of U9, which we already have here. So that's the cyclic subgroup generated by two. That has one, two, three, four, five, six elements. That's in fact all of U9, so that's interesting. But that also tells us that the order of two in this case is equal to, like I said, six. Okay, so now putting all of these things together, we see that the order of our permutation coupled with our number is the LCM of six and six, which is simply equal to six. Okay, let's move on. For our next very important result, let's look at the following leading observation. So let's take the group Z2 cross Z3 and the element one, one. But the order of one inside of Z2 is two, whereas the order of one inside of Z3 is three, and the LCM of two and three is six. But that means that this element one comma one generates a cyclic subgroup, which is isomorphic to Z6. And it's a six, and it's a cyclic subgroup of Z2 cross Z3. Oh, but let's notice now we have a six element subset of a six element set, which means those two things must be equal. But then those two things being equal gives us this nice isomorphism between Z6 and Z2 cross Z3. And now let's notice one more thing, and that is a very simple multiplication problem, that six is equal to two times three. So this raises the question, when can we smash two direct products of ZM or ZN type groups together? Well, notice we can do it in this case, but we can't do it in this case. Z2 cross Z4 is not cyclic. Let's notice it has eight elements, but none of the elements have order eight, whereas Z8 is cyclic. So now we're gonna prove a result 
answering the question when we can do this, when we can smash two Zn type groups together. Okay, so the theorem says that if we've got natural numbers m and n, then Zm cross Zn is isomorphic to Zmn if and only if the GCD of m and n is one. So in particular, it tells us exactly when Zm cross Zn is cyclic because it has m times n elements. So if it's not isomorphic to Zmn, then it's not cyclic because every cyclic group with Mn elements is isomorphic to this by a previous result. Another thing I'd like to point out is that this theorem is maybe a nice step along the way to something called the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, which is another step along the way to something called the fundamental theorem of finitely generated abelian groups. Okay, we've got an if and only if statement here, which means we've got two directions to prove. Let's prove the reverse direction first. Okay, so that means we need to suppose that the GCD of M and N is equal to one. And then after that, let's take an element, one comma one, inside of ZM cross ZN. And this is essentially motivated by what we saw with that Z2 cross Z3 case. Okay, so now let's notice that the order of our element 1, 1 is equal to the LCM of the order of 1 and the order of 1. Where the very important thing here is that this order of 1 is happening within ZM, whereas this order of one right here is happening within Zn. So context is really important in this case. Okay, but then we know that that is gonna be the LCM of M times N because one is an additive generator for each of those groups. But if you've got things that are relatively prime, their LCM is exactly equal to their product, so we have this is equal to M times N. And now we're gonna use this duality between an element and its cyclic subgroup to essentially finish this direction off. So let's look at the cyclic subgroup generated by one, one. So notice that'll be a group itself of order MN, which means it's isomorphic to ZMN. But it's also a subgroup of ZM cross ZN. And now we play this exact same game that we had before, and we observe that this has m times n elements, whereas this over here also has m times n elements. Okay, but then if they each have m times n elements and one is a subgroup of the other, then they must be equal. Okay, so then since they're equal, we have ZMN is isomorphic to ZM cross ZN. So let's write that down. ZMN is isomorphic to ZM cross ZN. And notice our isomorphism is written in the reverse direction, but you can reverse the direction of an isomorphism, well, based on the fact that it is symmetric. So now that we've done the reverse direction, let's go ahead and look at the forward direction. So now let's suppose that ZM cross ZN is isomorphic to ZMN, and let's take the GCD of M with N to be equal to the number D. And what we wanna do is show that D is in fact equal to one. And how can we do that? Well, since ZM cross ZN is isomorphic to a cyclic, cyclic group, it must be a cyclic group. So let's take A comma B inside of ZM cross ZN such that ZM cross ZN is equal to the cyclic group generated by A, B. Again, you know, maybe we should point this out. This is possible because we know that ZM cross ZN is cyclic because it's isomorphic to a cyclic group. And now we can finish this off with a pretty straightforward calculation. 
So let's observe the following. We have m times n is equal to the size of z m n. Okay. But then that's equal to the size of Zm cross Zn. So that's in fact always true, but that's equal to the order of our element A, B. But then by the previous result, we know that that is equal to the LCM of the order of A and the order of B. Okay. But then the largest the order of A can be and the largest the order of B can be is M and N. So this is less than or equal to the LCM of M, N. Okay, but then we can use this nice formula involving the LCM and the GCD and see that this is equal to M times N divided by the GCD. Okay, so let's maybe take a zoomed out view of this. Now we have m times n is less than or equal to m times n over d. But for that to be possible, d has to be equal to one. I think that's pretty clear just from arithmetic. We have d is equal to one. That's because, like, say d were bigger than one. Well, if d was bigger than one, we're dividing m times n by something bigger than one, which means we end up with something smaller, but then the inequality is not going in the right direction. So we have d is equal to one, but d was the GCD, and we wanted to show that the GCD is equal to one. So that finishes the reverse direction, and thus this proof. Okay, so let's look at some examples of this. So here's some examples of applications of this theorem. So let's look at z2 cross z3 cross z5. Now there are three ways that we can combine any two of these. Notice they're all relatively prime, so we can combine them using this theorem. So we have z2 cross z3 could combine to z6, giving us z6 cross z5. z3 cross z5 could com combine to z15, that would give us z2 cross z15. And finally, z2 and z5 could combine to z10, giving us z3 cross z10. But we still have pairs of relatively prime things, so we could combine each of those to z30. So that's a pretty interesting view that this thing over here, which doesn't seem like it would be cyclic until today, of course, is in fact cyclic. And now we can also use this to make lists of abelian groups of a certain order pretty easily. Now we haven't exactly proven that this is a way to produce all abelian groups of a certain order, but in fact it is. And we'll perhaps prove that later. And so notice we can produce three abelian groups of order eight fairly easily using this method. We have z2 cross z2 cross z2, and then we have z2 cross z4. So these are different. That's because z2 cross z2 cannot combine to z4 because their GCD is not one. And then z8 is different from either of those two as well. Again, because of this theorem. Actually, it's maybe the like inverse of this theorem, if you will, that says that these two are not isomorphic if and only if the GCD is bigger than one. Okay, so let's move on to a result like this about the groups of units. So for our next result, we'll prove that if the GCD of M and N is equal to one, then UMN is isomorphic to UM cross UN, where let's recall that's the multiplicative group of units modulo M and N respectively. Okay, so let's start our proof by showing that these two sets are the same size. And we can do that with the following equation. Recall that the size of UMN is going to be equal to the size of the following set. And that's all of the numbers between 1 and MN such that the GCD of that number with MN equals 1. That's exactly how you produce this set. Oh, but we've got a name for this, and the name for this is Euler's totient function evaluated at MN. That's exactly the definition of Euler's totient function. But then there's this fact that Euler's totient function is multiplicative when it has relatively prime inputs. If it doesn't have relatively prime inputs, it is not 
uh, multiplicative, but these are relatively prime, so we're good to go. This is phi m and then phi n. But we can rewrite that as the number of elements in the set between one and m that are relatively prime to m, and then times the number of elements in the set one to n that are relatively prime to n. Oh, but let's notice that that is exactly the size of um times the size of un, which is equal to the size of um cross un. Okay, so now we know that these are the same size, and now we need to define a map. So we need our map defined between these two sets. And our map is gonna go like this. So I'm gonna define our function, I'll call it psi, and it'll go from umn to um cross un. And it'll be defined by psi evaluated at a is equal to a comma a. So this a is thought of mod mn, whereas this one is mod m and that one is mod n. We just have to keep track of where we are in each of the entries. So now, since elements of the domain have different names because we're inside of UMN, we actually have to check that this is well-defined. That'll be the first thing that we have to check about this map. And again, that's because elements from the domain have different names because we're working modulo MN. Okay, so let's suppose in UMN, we have A is equal to B. And then, what does that tell us? That tells us that A is congruent to B modulo Mn. Okay, but that means that M times N divides B minus A. But then let's recall that M and N are relatively prime, and if Mn divides AB, that means that each of them individually divide A minus B. So we have M divides B minus A, and N also divides B minus A. But then that quickly leads us to see that A is congruent to B mod M and A is congruent to B modulo N as well. Okay, but that means that A equals B in UM and A equals B inside of UN. Great, remember being equal inside of that group of units means being congruent modulo whatever. But then from that it follows that if we have psi of A, that equals to A comma A, but that equals to B comma B because we've got that equality in UM and UN, but that equals to psi of B. So that shows us that it's well-defined. We took two things that perhaps had different names, but there were the same element in the domain and they get mapped to the same place under our function. And now we'll finish it off by showing that it's a bijective homomorphism, thus an isomorphism. So we started with the observation that these two sets have the same size, and then we constructed a well-defined map. Now we need to show that this map is a homomorphism and that it's injective. But injectivity will imply bijectivity because these are the same size by a pretty standard result about functions on finite sets. Okay, so let's show that it's a homomorphism first. So let's notice that psi of a times b is equal to a b a b, but that's pretty clearly equal to a a times b b, just by the group op operation that's happening everywhere but that's equal to psi of A times psi of B. So checking it's a homomorphism is pretty easy in this case. Really checking it's well-defined was the hardest part. Now let's check that it's injective. So let's start with psi of A equals psi of B, but that means that, let's see, A comma A equals B comma B, inside of um cross un, but that means that a equals b in um and a equals b inside of un. Oh, but that means that a is congruent to b modulo m and a is congruent to b modulo n. 
But now putting that together, essentially reversing what we did with the well-defined thing, we see that A is congruent to B modulo M times N. But from that, it uh, stand, but from that it follows that A equals B inside of U M times N. But that's exactly the condition we needed for injectivity. Okay, so I'm gonna hold off on some examples of this because it's essentially the same thing that we saw with those other examples. And we're gonna talk a little bit about something called the internal direct product. Now we're gonna look at a proposition which will motivate the idea of the internal direct product. Okay, so let's take a group G a subgroup of G called H, and a normal subgroup of G called N. Then this object called capital H, capital N, which is everything of the form little h times little n as h goes through all elements of h and n goes through all elements of n, is in fact a subgroup of G. And there's kind of a hidden requirement here that one of those subgroups at least is normal. And you can find nice counterexamples where if you don't have a normal subgroup and you form this object, it is not a subgroup. Okay, so let's see how this might go. And we're gonna use essentially that one step subgroup test. Let's first notice that this is most definitely non-empty because the identity is in both of these, thus the identity is in this. Okay, so now let's get to it. So let's suppose X and Y are both inside of H, N. And let's recall that what we wanna show is that X, Y inverse is inside of H, N. That'll finish this whole thing off using, like I said, that one step subgroup test. So that's what we'd like to show. Okay, now let's use the fact that the elements of H, N have a certain shape. So let's use the fact that X can be written as H1N1, whereas Y can be written as H2N2, like that. And now let's look at X, Y inverse, that's gonna be H1N1, and then H2N2, all inverse. So now using the shoes and socks theorem, we'll have H1N1, N2 inverse, H2 inverse. It reverses the order of that product. But now I'll combine N1, N2, inverse into something that I'll just call N because this is definitely an element of capital N given that capital N is a subgroup. So we have H1, N, H2, inverse. Now I'm gonna do this trick where I insert an identity in this spot right here and then use the fact that N is normal. And the version of the identity I'll insert there will be H2 inverse times H2. So that gives me something like this. Okay, but now let's recall that N is normal. And anytime N is normal and we do something like this, we end up with something inside of the normal subgroup. That's essentially the definition of the normal subgroup. So that means we can rewrite this as H, where I put these two terms together into something that's just inside of H using the fact that H is a subgroup, and then we'll call this N prime. But H times N prime is most definitely inside of HN. So since we started with XY in HN and we showed XY inverses in HN, we know that HN is in fact a subgroup. Okay, now let's look at the definition of the internal direct product. So here's the definition of the internal direct product. Let's suppose we've got a group G and we have two normal subgroups N1 and N2. Then we say that G is an internal direct product of N1 and N2 if the following two things are satisfied. N1 and N2 intersect to just the identity and then G is equal to this N1 times N2, or this N1 N2, this type of subgroup that we indeed looked at in the previous uh, chalkboard. Okay, so now why is this called an internal direct product? Well, that's because it's in fact related to an external direct product. If G is an internal direct product of N1 and N2, then we will show, then G is isomorphic to N1 cross N2. This is a super important theorem for taking groups that seem more complicated and breaking them into simpler pieces. Okay, we'll do this by finding a direct isomorphism between these two groups. Okay, so let's define the following map. 
So I'll call it phi, and it goes from N1 cross N2 into G. And what it does is it takes N1, N2, and turns it into N1 times N2. Okay. So let's first check that this is a homomorphism. And then, of course, after that, we have to check that it is one-to-one -one and onto. Okay. So in order to check that it's a homomorphism, we'll take A comma B and C comma D inside of N1 cross N2, and hopefully we can maybe factor across the map that we have. Okay, so we've got something like that, phi of A, B, C, D. So let's do the combination in the parentheses first. This will give us A, C, B, D, like that. But then our map tells us just to multiply those two things. So this is going to give us A, C, B, D. And now, although this is sort of like under the hood here with this definition of these two ordered pairs, I want to maybe explicitly write down that A, comma, C are both in N1, which is normal in the whole group. And then B comma D are both in N2, which is normal in the whole group. That'll be super important. So now I'd like to do a side calculation based on this, which will help us actually commute some things. This is actually a pretty nice side calculation. Okay, for our side calculation, let's look at the following object. We have C, B, C inverse, B inverse. So let's look at this bit of it right here. So C, B, C inverse. So since B is in N2 and we're conjugating by just elements of the group, we know that this is inside of N2. But then this is also inside of N2, which means the entire thing is inside of N2. So let's write it like that. Okay, so now let's go on the kind of other grouping. So let's look at B, C inverse B. So since C is in N1, that conjugation right there is also an element of N1. Okay, but then we've also assumed that C is an element of N1, but we're combining two things from N1, which means we are definitely inside of N1. But that means this whole thing is inside of N1 intersect N2, which is simply equal to the identity. Okay, but that means that we have CB, C inverse B inverse is equal to the identity. But then right multiplying by B and then C will tell us that CB is in fact equal to BC. So this is pretty interesting and this is a result that sort of is sometimes shown on its own and that is that elements from different normal subgroups here commute. If those normal subgroups intersect in just the identity. And you essentially use this trick. Okay, but anyway, we can commute B with C, leaving us with A, B, C, D. But that's pretty clearly equal to phi of A, B times phi of C, D, which is what we needed to do to show that this was a homomorphism. Okay, so now let's next show that it is also injective. So this is not so tricky, just given the simple structure of this. So let's suppose that phi of A, B equals phi of C, D. But that means that A times B is equal to C times D. But now let's left and right multiply by some things to end up with the following formula. We have C inverse A is equal to D, B inverse. But notice that C inverse A is a combination of things in N1. So that means this is an element of N1. But then D and B is a combination of elements in N2. So that means this is also in N2. But again, N1 and N2 intersect to the identity. So that means that C inverse A equals the identity, which is the same thing as D, B inverse. But that means that A equals C and B equals D. But that means the ordered pair A, B equals the ordered pair C, D. But that's what we needed to show for this thing to be injective. But now the last thing to show is that it's surjective and that's actually so short that we can fit it in right here. And it's all based on this assumption over here that G is equal to N1 times N2. 
So let's take something that I'll call a y in g, but that means that we can write y as a times b, where a is in n1 and b is in n2. Remember, that's our assumption over here having to do with the internal direct product. But now it's pretty clear that phi evaluated at AB will be equal to AB, which is equal to Y. So we found a preimage for that element of G. Okay, we've got a homomorphism, which is injective and surjective. That means it is an isomorphism, which proves this result. Now let's look at some applications of this result. So for our first example, let's consider the group of units mod eight. That's one, three, five, seven, where we're doing multiplication mod eight, like I said. Let's consider two cyclic subgroups, n1 and n2. n1 is generated by three. Notice three squared is equal to nine, which is the identity, so it has two elements, one and three, and that's, thus it's isomorphic to z2. n2 is similarly generated by five, and it's also isomorphic to z2 for essentially the same sort of reason. Let's also notice that these two subgroups intersect to just the identity, which is one in this case. And furthermore, after looking at it, the only thing that's missing from these two subgroups is the element seven, which is in fact equal to three times five inside of U8, because three times five is eight, which is seven mod eight. But that means that U8 is the product N1, N2, but then applying this theorem, we know that U8 is isomorphic to the cyclic subgroup generated by three, cross the cyclic subgroup generated by five, but each of those is Z2, so this is in fact isomorphic to Z2 cross Z2. All right, let's look at another example. Our next example has to do with dihedral groups. So let's take D2N to be the symmetry group of a 2N gon where N is odd. So we've got 2N rotations and 2N reflections. And then we'll keep, and then we'll take two normal subgroups, N1, which is generated by S and R squared. So those are all of the rotations attached to even exponents of R. And then also all of the reflections attached to even exponents of R. But you can kind of easily check that this is isomorphic to DN, the symmetries of a regular N gon. Furthermore, we can take N2 to be the cyclic subgroup generated by R to the N, but since R to the 2N is the identity, this only contains two elements, and thus it is isomorphic to Z2. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the details. They're fairly routine calculations, but you can check that each of these is normal in the parent group D2N. Furthermore, D2N is equal to the product N1, N2, and these two intersect to the identity. I think it's fairly clear they intersect to the identity because R to an odd power is not an element of this thing, given these are all even powers of R. And we assume that N was odd. But all of these things together applied to our previous theorem tells us that D2N is isomorphic to Z2 cross Zn. I really like this result. That means that D14 is isomorphic to Z2 cross D7, for instance. And D6 is isomorphic to Z2 cross D3. But then D3 is the same thing as S3, so this is in fact isomorphic to Z2 cross S3. Now I'll leave you with some warm-ups. I've got four warm-ups based on what we just saw today. The first is to find the order of 615.4 inside of Z30 cross Z45 cross Z24. The next is to find the order of 3SR123 inside of U7 cross D12 cross S3. So this is albeit a bit silly, but I think that's okay. Then next, let's write Z2 cross Z3 cross Z4 cross Z5 as many ways as possible. So let's recall that we can shove these together in certain cases based on a theorem that we saw. Then next, let's find as many non-isomorphic abelian groups of order 20 as possible. And finally, let's write U15 as an internal direct product. And maybe like bonus points, if you can write it in the end as Z something cross Z something, as many of those Zs as you need. You should be able to do that by just decomposing as internal direct products maybe one or two times. And that's a good place to stop.